And welcome back, Ultimate fans, to sunny San Diego, California, for a quarterfinal matchup from the men's division at the USA Ultimate Club National Championships. Keith Rayner joined by Cody Mills for this game between the number one overall seed in the men's division, Seattle Sakai, and the seventh seed, Minneapolis Sub-Zero. Two teams that have had some tight games this tournament, but are still alive. One of the two of the eight teams alive for a title right now, and they both have eyes on the prize. Absolutely, Sakai enters the tournament as the number one overall seed, certainly the title favorite. In sanctioned play this season, Sakai is undefeated, save for a loss to Sub Zero in pool play at the Pro Elite Challenge in Colorado. So, a rematch here of the one team to take down Sakai in a game that counted, playing for their title hopes. Yeah, it, you know, the. Team that beat you at your first tournament of the season, see each other again at the last tournament of the season. Talk about a, a measuring stick. Really get a temperature of, of how you've improved since that matchup. And we will talk plenty about that previous matchup over the course of this one. All the way back at the Pro Elite Challenge, the two teams played. But I think both teams have come a long way since then and would probably downplay what that game really means considering that it was so long ago there's personnel changes, there's tactical changes, and we'll probably see that all on display, but Sub-Zero will begin on defense in the blacks, pulling from right to left on your screen. Sakai in the whites. Sub-Zero fresh off a quarterfinal victory over Toronto Goat, where they won 15-11. A pretty wide margin, but that game actually was tied to Levens. Sub had opened up a, a little bit of a lead, but Goat broke back to tie at 11 before his Sub ultimately pulled away. This weekend, we've come to expect extremely clean offense from Sub Zero out of their vertical stack set. Lots of, lots of throws from Ryan Osgar, lots of impressive play from Ryan Osgar, but he's far from the only cutter on this line. Their defense has been able to apply pressure, obviously, to get margins like a 14 11 win, but the offense certainly the heart of this team so far at Nationals. We'll see what their defense has to offer first. As we see Josh Klain, member of that offense who won't be competing. You saw him with the sling on. They'll have to do it without Klain. And we get started with Sakai getting it into the hands of Simon Montague and then Dylan Freechild, two names who may lead this team in touches over the course of this game. Up ahead to the instantly recognizable Matt Rader. Raider with a slick offline to Chris Kassedner. Keeps it in bounds on the throw to Montague and he continues to the speedy free child for a quick hold. Free child showing off his signature energy and fire after the score with the celebration. Clinical offense from Sakai. When Sakai is clicking, they are, as well as Sub-Zero, one of the strongest offenses in the division. They have a lot of individual talent, but they make space for each other really well. There you saw an isolation play, isolating the top half of the screen, uh, the pike play for Trent Dillon going deep. And then as that strong side wane, they switch the field, get it all the way across to Montague, and as the defense is adjusting, Montague is able to exploit that break advantage and hit Freechild down the line. Montague having a tremendous season, and Freechild, of course, one of the stars in the men's division. When I talked to Sakai coach Mike Caldwell prior to the game, he said that one of the team's biggest strengths were athleticism and quickness in the handler space. Dylan Freechild, of course, bringing a wealth of both of those aspects. Four-time Ulti-World All-Club selection the past two years on the first team. Former Callahan Award winner as well. And the accolades are everywhere for Dylan Freechild, a World's Game team member, a Next Gen Tour member, an extremely accomplished college player. He's really done it all, arguably the most publicized ultimate player ever. I think the only one in the running, besides Brody Smith, is Jimmy Mickle for on-field accomplishments. As far, as far as the men's divisions go, yes. And and free trial, you know, he's never won player of the year. Two runner-ups, he was runner-up player of the year in club and runner-up one year in college. Has a, has a chance to win that award this season, but I'm sure he's more concerned about winning what I believe was his second title, even one in, College or two? Oregon Everybody, never won college. Never won. So he's he's never won a title. 
except for international play. Correct. Well, we'll get our first look at Sub-Zero's offense. And you mentioned the level of efficiency they've been able to deliver. And uh, as we see a stoppage of play, uh, this is a Sub-Zero team that's not afraid of anybody. Certainly not a Sakai team that they've beaten, but they feel like they can hang with any team at this tournament. They lost on double game point to the number two Same seed two. at Randy Chip. Pony. Good good. Yeah, their offense, offensive ability should give them confidence. If you don't turn the disc over, you can hang with anybody. They've, they've got the talent on, on both sides of the disc. And Seattle, Seattle Sockeye coach Mike Caldwell praised their opponent. Said they were going to be a tough test. Disc now with Greg Cousins. Nice matchup at the top of the stack here between Nathan Kwan and Jason Sheeta, two of the quicker players in the division. Sheeta, one of the points of emphasis was slowing down Jason Sheeta for and Mike Caldwell, and Kwan's going to be one of their top handler defenders, especially against another small player like Sheeta. Absolutely, and Sakai right now playing in a, an FM set to give Nathan Kwan the ability to face guard the FM dump and try and use his quickness to just out-duel Cheetah. Matches up well with Sub-Zero's vertical stack look. Reset. Back to Andrew Roy. And now a shot from Ryan Osgar. He's frustrated with himself as he misses on that one. Looking for Cousins in the end zone. Yeah, lots of frustration from Osgar, and at a first glance, that might seem like a speculative throw, but Ryan Osgar hits that throw at 90 plus percent. So surprising to see him miss execution there. So Sakai with an early break opportunity. Get the reset off, and now over to Julian Hausman. And an easy under, just missed on. Un un Unclear whether that's on the fault of the receiver or the thrower, but Ben Snell unable to get a completion out of that, so Sub-Zero with a second life here. Nick Simonelli up ahead to Osgar, and Osgar's the centerpiece of this Sub-Zero offense. Absolutely, he makes them extremely dynamic, able to get separation under and really show off his throwing arsenal after that. And a quality break throw from Simonelli up ahead to Nick Vogt. Get Sub Zero their first hold. They match Sockeyes to make it one to one. Yeah, great work from the Sub Zero Cutter Core on that point. Sam Seminelli, Greg Cousins, Nick Vote. All around a strong group of cutters that Ryan Osgar is really, as you said, the centerpiece of in terms of making them dynamic, but all of them have quality throws, good timing, and sense of spacing. It's what makes their offense so strong. Just lots of room on that break side if the thrower can manage to access it. And you can see here that initial break throw sets up Simonelli, and then he gets his foot outside the mark. That's actually one of the things that I look for as a coach for breaking the mark. If you can get your foot outside of the mark's outside foot, you're almost always going to be able to get off the throw. So nice job stepping out by Simonelli, who's, who's not a name I think is uh, well known in, in the club division, but has been incredibly productive, and if, if you didn't, if teams didn't know about him before, they've learned about him this year. Nick Simonelli has been very effective for the Sub Zero offense. It, I think last year was a bit of his national coming out party. He really lit up the stat sheet at nationals for Sub Zero, among the division leaders and goals. Simonelli getting his first assist of the game, but he's someone that that Sakai will have to contend with if they want to slow down. The Sub-Zero offense, Montague, air bounces a backhand to the break side for Xander Cuisant Sice. Trent Dillon resets to Kassedner. Tough grab by Freechild, but makes it and continues to Raider. Break side sideline with a lot of open room for Sakai, so they try and go there, but a little too casual of a throw from Montague falls to the grass. So the first break opportunity for Sub-Zero will begin as so many have previously with Tristan Vandermortel 
He'll take a quick look deep, but well beyond the reach of Cole Jurek. So, so far, neither defense getting much going on offense once they've gotten the disc and giving that back to the O-lines. Yeah, not what either thrower was looking for in those possessions. Montague threw the elevator backhand, which would sit in space, but he threw it a little behind his receiver, and Simonelli, or uh, excuse me, Ben Mortel, just a little too spicy on that flick hook. Montague finds Phil Murray. Trent Dillon's really beginning to open deep this point, but Sakai, so far, not willing to service the cut. A completely unmarked Phil Murray with the disc, and Sakai does little with that advantage. Free child looking reset. Takes the yardage loss to Montague. Back with Murray. He's on Tice with another wide open under. He has been counter cutting off of those Dylan deep cuts very effectively, but another high throw from Sakai looking for Cuisant Tice. Free child unable to connect with his teammate and a red zone turnover for Sakai. Offense not looking sharp on this point. Yeah, I like their use of lateral space a lot to advance up the field and exploit the defense overplaying one side, but they can't finish in the red zone. Just missed execution on that throw, but a tighter window than I think they needed to, to look into. Cody Wood looking deep from that front cone and the full field shot gets Sub-Zero a hard earned break. Josh Couts on the other end of that contested catch. Sub-Zero surges into the early lead two to one. Yeah, great look. So Sub-Zero took the same look both times they had the disc, which is that nine or the cut into the break side and deep, which has a lot of names, but uh, many people might call it a butterfly cut, putting that flick out into space. Well, I have to watch out for the stack a little bit, and obviously Van Mortel messed up the first time, but Cody Wood puts a perfect one out there for Josh Couts. And I, I will say, I, I talked to Sub-Zero coach Talos Boyd before the game, and he talked about the, the team's focus on themselves and said that they were going to be looking for offensive execution, and when I Pressed him to, to explain what that looks like. He talked about hitting open hands, patient looks, avoiding being trigger happy. And that, that when the team got too aggressive with their decisions as throwers, it was often their undoing. So despite the success of the offense right now, I imagine that he's going to say, hey, we want to see less of these 50-50 deep throws and more of the level of execution that we've been practicing. So... Look at the replay. I mean, this is a heavily contested catch, and see if maybe Couts not even in on the landing. I mean, he's right around on the on the line. Observer is making the active in out call there, though, so not was, a chance for. It was hard be. because he and Murray's feet, I think, hit at the same time. Hard to distinguish whose feet was on who. But either way, it's now a break for Sub Zero. Sakai O-line looking to respond. Jannon underneath the Camden Allison Hall. Montague fights around the mark for Free Child. Bryce Dixon squeezes free on the open side and hits Free Child up the line. He gets his second goal. So now tied at two to two. You can see Free Child heavily involved in the Sakai offense. Yeah, Free Child really making great use of his marks positioning after he releases the disc. One of the easiest times to get open is right after you've thrown the disc because the mark is on the wrong side of you and you can either accelerate in that direction and have him over pursue or accelerate in that direction and be open. Free Child multiple times in this game has released the disc immediately ran downfield to force his mark to respect him, hit multiple legs of spaces with that cut, and eventually got open on the other side of the field. So really great work by Free Child to stay active within the confines of the offense, not cutting off other looks downfield. Don't Free Child may be the most 
famous give and go thrower in in uh, ultimate. This guy who moves moves as soon as he throws it, and he puts so much pressure on his defender. In that case, it was Colin Barry who. I imagine it's going to see a lot of, of free child and the other top players on this Sakai team. Sub -Zero, for Sub-Zero, he's in many ways one of their downfield stoppers. That time not able to stop free child. Yeah, it's a tougher matchup for Colin Berry, who's a taller player. He had the Mark Lloyd matchup a fair bit in their GOAT quarterfinal. And free child, not short, but 5'10 and more of an agility player, whereas Colin Berry clearly has deep skills. Sakai now showing a cup zone. Four players around the disc, a lot of traffic. Big mark of Julian Hausman there. Cousins, chiseling cut, slips on the catch and travel call. You see Duncan Lin, Nathan Kwan, and D.Y. Chen all in that cup. All players who could, in theory, play the aggressive open side of the cup, so really an, expect an enterprising group of downfield defenders to try and take advantage of those crashes. Cheetah using the hammer fake frequently try and freeze the mark because they know he might throw that but so does the downfield defender. That's Christian Foster jumping in to break up the speculative throw of Cheetah. Foster does a really good job of avoiding contact while still getting that block. It seems like it was going to be eminent but gets through clean. Great play by him. D.Y. Chen over to Hausman in the red zone. Great opportunity for Sakai to get back the break. They recently conceded. Give and go for Hausman. Curl cut forces a switch. And the defenders can't navigate that gracefully. Nathan Kwan collects the break. Sakai gets this one back on serve and now leads three to two. Yeah, great North Carolina connection in the handler battery there for Sakai. Ben Snell and Nathan Kwan. Ben Snell, a former captain of Nathan Kwan's when they both played for UNC Darkside. Now Ben Snell, a Sockeye captain, as they take their talents to Seattle. Plenty of plenty of uh, players who came up in, in outside of this region. You think of Seattle as a place of so much homegrown youth talent, but look at the players who made big impacts on that play. Hausman, Snell, Juan Foster gets the block. None of those are Seattle area guys. A lot of imports for this Sakai team. I've seen a lot of Trent Dillon. Certainly. Simon uh, Montague. Oh, well, he came up in the in the Seattle area, but applied his trade elsewhere. Yeah, very few purebred Seattleites on this team. Derek Morad, who appears to be injured on the sideline. D.Y. Chen. Tony Veneri. Tony Veneri. UW products that stayed in Seattle, but as you said, Keith, many of these players, even if they went to high school in Seattle, were out of state for college. But the majority of them were unaffiliated completely until they came to Sakai. Yeah, not not even Northwest players. I mean, it, there are some other Northwest players like Jacob Jannon and Dylan Freechild, Xander Cuzon Tice. But, Garrett Martin, Utah State. Yeah. But there are plenty of players from outside who've been drawn to Seattle. Hussein Carnegie and Ben Katz now on this D-line. Katz getting ready to mark. Two more examples of East Coast imports for Seattle. A bit of a different story for Sub-Zero's roster composition. Osgar looking deep for a vote. Drops in. Cousins gets an aggressive mark from Foster who's not known for being a gentle defender by any means. Certainly willing to create some contact on defense. But it works maybe in the head of the of the offender is Cousins with a inexplicable throw away. Yeah, really wasting a dime ball from Ryan Osgar <laughs> that put him on the doorstep. Fortunately, he's got a, a healthy reserve of great throws, but they're going to need them because Sakai might not give them a lot of chances. Underneath catch for Mitch Kulsak and a wide open Hussein Carnegie in the deep space. Sub zero, three straight goal, or Seattle Sakai, three straight goals to get in front of Sub Zero 42. Yeah, Hussein Carnegie 
putting Kevin Brown on his heels a little bit downfield. He was in the initiation cutter. Then you saw Kolchak make the fill cut. Carnegie was still isolated, able to drive in a little bit to put his defender on, the he on his heels and get eight yards of separation. And with one of your most athletic receivers downfield, that's a look that you almost have to hit. You see Kolchak on the fill cut here. No flash on the mark to disrupt the Huck release point and just too much space for Carnegie. Yeah, you got to be kicking yourself if you're sub-zero on that point. Super unforced turn on the goal line and a relatively fast reversal as Sakai catches in the break. Carnegie getting free for his first goal. Sub taking not an official timeout, but nonetheless huddling in the middle of the field, trying to steady themselves mentally after Sakai converts the break. And, th and their line was actually on. So the players who were on the line now, the offense basically uh, looks like the O line and their, their subs uh, were not in the huddle. The huddle was purely the defense, maybe saying, like, hey, right now we're in a hole. We're going to have to get us back into this game. And to be frank, Sub-Zero's offense is, has not looked like what you expect from this team. Even the goal that they got, A, may have not been a goal, but B, was a heavily contested catch. So right now the offense not really clicking. They've hit on a couple of looks, but the mistakes are putting them in a difficult spot. Yeah, I think I may have commentator cursed them by just building up their offense in the beginning of the game. But it, it was true. Prior to this, very few unforced errors out of them. Lots of throws that you think would be hard, like that Osgar backhand that he missed on and then eventually hit. But lots of throws that you think are hard, they hit consistently, not swinging their way. But it's still early. I just, I'm just i surprised given how much Boyd focused on the team's patience and poise and being, being willing to take a lot of throws rather than try and do it in one. But they've been aggressive and maybe to their detriment as they now trail 4-2. to two. Andrew Roy centers up to Sheeta. I mean, Mike Caldwell called this Sub-Zero team hard-nosed on both sides of the ball. You know, in Seattle, they like to call it the ball, not the disc. And, uh, you know, that's not the team that we're seeing right now. It's not a team that wants to grind it out. So Sub-Zero maybe lacking their identity. Charles Weinberg gets it over to the break side for Simonelli. Now Osgar with an away shot. For Simonelli. Yeah, sub, I keep harping on it, but that, that counter cut across the field as they move laterally to one side, then hitting over the stack across the field, it's a difficult throw, but sub loves it. And Ryan Osgar can really throw it. And here the, the motion of the offense is to the bottom of the screen. It's obviously not immediately fluid, but Simonelli cuts this way first, turns around, and Osgar just hits him in stride with that flick. And as we mentioned, Osgar really has blossomed in the star of this Sub-Zero team, piling up gaudy statistics all season long, including at Nationals where he leads the men's division in points in the top 10 in both goals and assists, a category I believe he leads in. So Sub has played in a lot of USAU events this year. So the score reporter page lists the aggregate stats. But if you count the three assists, I've two assists I've seen him throw here. He has two, yes? Just one. Maybe one. Okay. If you count that assist, that gives him 60 recorded assists on the season in addition to 20 goals. It's a big old number. Yeah. The next highest person on sub has 20. So you can really see how much of a fulcrum he is for their offense. Absolutely. And, and Coach Caldwell said, you know, slowing down, slowing down Osgar was going to be one of the most important matchups. Really want to re limit his yardage as a receiver, try and get him catching the disc in difficult positions so the throws, his continued throws would have to be harder. And I think for the most part they've done that. All Osgar's best throws have been difficult ones. Yeah, it's tricky. You want to force him out, ideally, but if they can break the mark to him, then it's, it's very difficult to keep the disc out of his hands. Yeah, Colbo conceded that Osgar's so good, he's going to get you in some way, so you got to put him in the worst position possible. Montague bounces it around, and perhaps a, a too clever by half 
by Simon Montague. Yeah, it's Montague's second missed execution today. Not quite dialed in yet. It's Sakai's first game of the day, so perhaps he's just getting used to the conditions. But to be to be honest and, and somewhat critical of Montague, who's had a tremendous season as a very talented player, this is something we have seen from him in past past sections. I mean, he has had this style of play that sometimes he tries really tricky stuff and it can bite him. Sub-Zero looks off the open deep look to Jurek and he trucks back under for some yardage and he'll take the deep look himself. Charlie McCutcheon on the receiving end, but Trent Dillon interferes. McCutcheon barely gets off the ground as Dillon knocks that one away. Yeah, and that's definitely the the combination that Sakai would want. Jurek, Jurek hucking to McCutcheon. Jurek, one of the more athletic and better deep players on the team, and McCutcheon fast but a little bit short. So Sakai winning even before the throw goes up. And speaking of throws going up, if you're going to throw to Matt Raider, you might as well put it up, especially when there's no one over six feet in the area. An easy goal for Matt Raider. And I, I, I can't harp on it enough. I mean, Sub-Zero has not scored an easy goal. All of their, all of their looks are hard. And I, that's probably a credit to what has been a tremendous Sub-Zero or Sakai defense this season. I mean, they, they apply a lot of defensive pressure, uh, but they're making or offering Sub the opportunity to take difficult throws, and Sub has been willing to take them. And mostly he's come up empty-handed. Yeah, I, uh, I generally agree. <laughs> It's it's still a drop off. I, I've seen the sub team perform at that level, and maybe it's just the half step of speed you gain from playing a top four team like Sakai. Maybe it's the occasion of quarters. Maybe it's just the commentators' curse. But really, not hitting at the level that they have shown to be their their average. Sub sub only trailing by one break though, so a uh, rough run of play hasn't put them in in too bad a position. But certainly some corrections to be made for Minneapolis. But Sakai, not, not a team that tactically wants to let you get comfortable. So I don't imagine that Sakai is just going to wait around for Sub-Zero to make adjustments. Yeah, Sakai has thrown force middle end zone and a little bit of matchup so far. And they've only played three. <laughs> I mean, Col Colwell identified Sub-Zero as a team with a tight system. They like to stick to the system pretty well. And, Sakai was going to try a lot of different things to mix it up and see if they could disrupt that system. And so, new, so I think you're going to see them continue to rotate through defensive tactics. Yeah, a new look here, more of a 1-3-3 three, three zone as opposed to the four-person cup that we saw before. Uh, lots of new faces in the cup, or one new face in the cup with Billy Katz. And you can see Snell switching the mark a little bit to make it difficult. Snell being the, the person, the one on the mark, to always force the direction of the disc rather than one directional trap. Cheetah facing the cup now from this near third. Not a ton of pressure on these resets right now, so the handlers moving the disc, but not a lot of upfield options, so they have to try the hammer. Find vote with lots of room. And now into the red zone. Sheeta finishes it off for Osgar, who gets his first goal of the game. Sheeta gets his first assist as Sub Zero gets a hold to make it 5 to 4. Yeah, fair de defensive play from Sakai. Trying to take away arguably Sub's best weapon in Ryan Osgar catching the disc in space and throwing to a one on one cutter. A zone certainly does that. Forces him to be the continue cutter instead because. His hucks are great, and I'm sure he can throw a hammer, but it's not necessarily the thing that he consistently kills you with. So fair play from Sakai. Nice work from Sub to get through it. The, the real turning point here will be to see if Sub can turn up the pressure on defense or alternatively, or alternatively if Sakai continues to be a little on edge with their decision making. Some very notable defenders on this Sub-Zero defense. And they feel pretty confident. We talked a little bit about Colin Berry, but they feel very good about what Tristan Vandermortel and Cody Wood can do to harass other handlers. And they added Kevin Pettit-Scantling in the middle of the year. And big KPS. Can really be a threat against 
your opposing downfield weapons. He's six on the line, number negative 80. Actually, uh, just fun fact about the sub-zero numbers, USAU does not allow you to have numbers below zero, so technically that little rectangle on their jersey is artistic. Uh, and I think that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Deep throw to Raider, jump ball, easy collection for Raider. Simon Montague with a bomb for Matt Raider. Montague with a bomb, great throw, nice play by Raider, but you're really asking for it if you're forcing Matt Raider out. You're, you're just really asking for it. And Sub, I, I've had a lot of complimentary things to say about Sub, but watching them play against Goat, Goat went to the deep game again and again, and it kept them in the game. And whenever they were forced to grind under, Sub got turns, but they were a little stubborn about leaving that deep space open. And especially with a thrower like Montague and a receiver like Raider, that's going to be a tough sell in a game like this. Back-to-back -back deep scores for Matt Raider, both looking relatively effortless for the big Sakai veteran. He is a longtime member of Sakai in his 12th season from the team, famously. Began with them back when he was just a teenager, I believe at age 16 started playing with this Sakai club and has gone from baby-faced high schooler to consummate veteran on this Sakai team as we get a chance to look at the conditions here at the park here in San Diego. Beautiful and still for the most part. Have yet to see the wind that was a feature yesterday appear today. Yeah, and this round yesterday, round two in particular, was the peak of the wind. Yeah, I mean, round one was exactly as it was today, comfortable, but uh, so far, those conditions have held. Do you think that favors one of these teams? Do you think one of these teams might be better in the win than the other? I think they both love their high degree of difficulty throws and would be a little reticent to let go of them, so. Free child crossing over to match up with Osgar, but that doesn't prevent Osgar from throwing another fading away shot to the end zone. I think he's two for two on those. Maybe three Maybe three for four, but finds another assist. This one to Kevin Brown. Yeah, it's Brian Osgar stays dropping dimes. I mean, the guy is, the guy is dang good. There's no, no, no doubt about that part. Yeah, it's interesting. Against big throwers like that, Sometimes we talked about them getting on the break side before a lot of the time when you're trying to force them out. So another another way to think about it is to force them in on the trap side and just try your best to disrupt on the mark and at least make them throw, like you said, from a more difficult position. But there they get him on the trap side and still uses the back shoulder throw to get his receiver open. I mean, if you're, if you're Sakai on, on defense, Cody, and you're, and you're seeing a player who's taking a lot of really difficult throws but is hitting on them at a, at a relatively high rate, What's your what's your plan? Do you say, hey, you know, that's the look we want them to take. Some of those are going to come our way, or is it, hey, if he's going to hit those, we have to adjust. There are a couple different ways you can go about it. Depends on what you think your team is best at. A lot of times these looks are coming out of motion, so you could try and hedge and tr get a block earlier in the point by playing a transition D. You could literally try doubling them if you think there's someone on the other team that you can help off of and just extra deny the disc and funnel it towards somebody else. Or you can uh, have select poaches. Like when that guy has the disc, you, you throw different uh, blockers in the lane. But lots of options. A little early, I think, for Sakai to concede, but clearly Osgar brought today a game. Free Child continues to be a focal point of this Sakai offense having come out on defense and now looks no worse for wear as he comes out on O. Montague throws one past one receiver into the hands of a waiting Matt Raider and a pick call, however. Raider able to save possession but not able to get the yardage out of it. Yeah, it was tough to tell from the angle we have whether Montague is trying to hit Raider or uh, Phil Murray coming across. But if it was Murray, that would have been Montague's third miscue. 
We'll never know. Montague comes in with a short reset for Free Child. Free Child under some pressure, but Montague frees him up. And the two continue to play catch until they finally find Phil Murray. And again, Matt Rayner has a, another throw. We'll never know if it was to him or not because Bryce Dixon takes to the air for the layout score to make it 7-5. to five. Yeah, Sakai in that short field had three cutters really compressed in the end zone, keeping their defenders occupied and just played a little bit of dominator set in the four-person and eventually hit the continue to the end zone. Great play by Bryce Dixon. Uh, one of those things where it's like he lays out to make a hard catch and it would really be unfortunate if it led to a drop because Raider had a clap catch. But at the end of the day, no worries. Stoke the highlight reel. That's what the people came to see. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, if, if you're a cutter, it's it's kind of a situation where you want to assume every throws to you. Oh, yeah. You want to make sure you secure the catch. Uh, I mean, maybe you doink it there and, and Raider's there to back you up. So I'm sure Sakai would prefer to have two open players to one. Yeah, I mean, I can't. You can't fault Bryce Dixon for that. He can't see behind him. Like you right. have to attack the disc aggressively. Just, I'm happy they avoided the the unfortunate situation. So Trent Dillon and Dylan Freechild over on defense for this point. Both players were on the opening offensive line, as long as well as uh, regular defensive players: Julian Hausman, Billy Katz, Maddie Russell, Ben Snell, and Nathan Kwan. Dylan, Dylan and Dylan, known for their defensive acumen as well. So, suitable crossover players. Although, man, Nathan Kwan is is going to get to the disc about 20 yards ahead of any of his teammates. Showing off the wheels. They're not big wheels, but they spin quick. Oh, yeah. Still taking that Jason Cheetah matchup. Stoppage in play as the disc reaches Weinberg. Foster in coverage. Vertical stack right now. Tony Paletto off the back. Simonelli. Over to the break side for Sub-Zero now in the hands of Kevin Brown as there's a pick downfield. Brown, formerly of Madison Club. His first year with Sub-Zero. That Sub is, so far this weekend, done a great job of moving laterally. We'll see if they can continue that in the short field here. Osgar marked by Dylan now. Dylan with the wide mark. And Osgar takes advantage, throws the backhand to the forehand side, sneaks it past the defense. A, a cheeky look from Osgar there, just inches over the defender's hands. Degree of difficulty remains high, but. Osgar showing off the level of execution. Yeah, taking a look here. A little more static, I think, than most teams would prefer in the end zone. But Osgar calls his shot just over Matty Russell's hands. And uh, Nick Salmonelli is excited about it. I, I mean, I, I think that really he sees that Matty Russell's not looking. And points saying, let me just throw you to space. Russell won't know until after you do, and you'll be able to make the play. But Russell shows off the athleticism and nearly make that play anyway. Certainly. Russell obviously face guarding, or for sure face guarding. But I think the sketchy part of that is the distance at which the face guard happens because you have the time to react, and the throw was soft. So it wasn't like it would be well past him by the time he realized it. So the distance and the, the weight of the throw, I think, made it a little sketchier. But absolutely, it's, it's a great way to punish a face guard. Sub-Zero back within one, but Sub uh, Seattle just one goal away from taking half. So the Sakai O-line looking to ultimately initiate that 10-minute break. See 
Greg Cousins crossing over from the O-line for this point. As Sub tries to stack a little bit to get closer before half. Full centered by Murray. Up to Montague. Vanden Mortel on the mark. A little bit of poaching in the lane. Try and get the disc out of Montague's hands and disrupt the upfield lane. You can see the handler guard, number 21, poaching off to disrupt that isolation space. And even a little help on the near side of the screen from number 18. And downfield, it's not a proper zone, but you can really see Cole Jurek, Jurek helping off into the deep space while the three defenders on the upper side of the screen are all fronting. Jurek guarding Matt Rader, who's on the near side wing. Classic host deck poach. Jurek, I I've watched Jurek lead this D-line in many ways. He is hyper-communicative. He looks like a middle linebacker out there, and not just with those broad shoulders. It's a huge hammer goes over the top of the defense. Yep. Into the red zone, and a quick give and go sends us to halftime. Jacob Janin finishing off that goal and that half with his first visit to the end zone for Sakai. And that gives them an 8-6 lead and the advantage as we go to the break. I think that stoppage was pretty beneficial for Sakai to be able to diagnose the poaching scheme that Sub had, and as Sub tried to fall out of it, Sakai immediately looked to punish it. Murray just rifling a hammer past Jurek and Cousins as they tried to navigate their respective responsibilities in the deep space. Caught them really in transition and takes advantage with the big throw. So despite the early jitters, Sakai goes into half, up a single break on Sub-Zero, and looking to play their way into the semifinal spot. But a nice matchup so far. The early jitters from Sub-Zero's O have really settled down. So a lot on the line for these two teams who have played close before. Can Sub-Zero score another upset over vaunted Sakai, or will it be Sakai who moves on to the men's semifinals? We'll be back to find out the answer to those questions in the second half in about 10 minutes. different shapes and sizes, but our uniforms don't. Equipped with multiple jersey cuts, lengths, and sizes, Full Circle is the perfect fit for your whole team. Look better, feel better, play better. Full Circle. gets you closer to the players and personalities you care about with game video, in-depth written and video analysis. Uh, he's going to take off deep, but what he does is very simple, documentary shorts. And we've played Bird Squad before and it, it just feels a little bit harder to lose this year. And a whole lot more. To get your subscription or learn more, go to ultiworld.com slash subscribe.
Jay Prude. What an incredible layout catch. On free child and Prude comes down with it. and make the grab. Welcome back to Ulti World's live streaming coverage of the 2019 USA Ultimate Club National Championships. Coming to you from San Diego, California. Some beautiful waterbound vessels here. And if you stayed for the halftime show, you might have caught some clips from last year's Club National Championships. Sakai's epic but eventually unsuccessful bid to make it through the semifinals. They're trying to get back there now and hold an 8-6 lead in the quarterfinals over Sub-Zero. Your first half stats summary. Yeah, we see a pretty even half that reflects the flow of the game. Both teams with three break chances. Sakai a little more efficient on theirs. Sub essentially has tried to huck every time they've gotten the disc on defense, and it's worked one time. Uh, but both teams have really cleaned up their offensive game. Sub-Zero in particular as the half wore on, and really a little bit of execution fallibility for Seb, a little bit of decision fallibility for Sakai, but other than that, a relatively clean half. We'll see which team regresses to the mean in the second half. Osgar with a slow start for Sub-Zero, but picked it up pretty quickly, and now it's piled up four points in this game, a, a, an assist to go with three goals, or three assists to go with one goal, excuse me. A little more spread out on the other side, but we have seen a lot of Simon Montague and Dylan Freechild getting touches for Sakai. Also a pair of goals for big man Matt Rader, both in the deep space. So Sub-Zero 
will have their attention dialed in on Raider, who's tough to miss on the field. Yeah, certainly one of the biggest presences and bodies on the field at 6-4. The Sockeye's got a little collection of big men on their team now between Simon Montague, Julian Hausman, Ben Snell, Matt Raider. Pull goes up, Sub-Zero receives. Sheeta sends it over in a flying poach block by Matty Russell. He takes off to take possession for Sakai. Now here's Snell around break. Foster gets the goal and Sakai starts the second half in idyllic fashion with a break to take a 9-6 lead. Yes, you saw Sub-Zero come out at that point and try and set up an isolation space on the top of the screen. Sockeye defenders did well to not get dragged out of the play. They all helped into the lane, shrinking that ISO space, and eventually Matty Russell takes advantage, reads the throw, and jumps the route to get the block. I will say that in the quarterfinals that I've referenced a couple times, the, the previous game that Sub played today, Goat's biggest successes came when they started being switchier and helping more off of unthreatening cutters. So if Sakai can continue to deploy a strategy similar to that, it's likely they'll continue to see the results. And that, that's a big focus of Sakai's style of defense. Uh, this is a team that looks to for opportunities to help, that tries to view defense as a more team concept rather than seven individuals trying to shut down their matchups. And this is a team that's gonna look for those opportunities to take up space more than just take away individuals. Foster, former Ironside veteran, played at Carlton, played his high school ultimate at Amherst. Noted puller and gets the break goal. He's got that spin pull that few use, but it's one of his signatures. Yeah, uh, one of the few other people I can think of off the top of my head is his teammate, Dylan Freechild, also a spin puller. Catches the offense deep now, so Sub-Zero trying to work out of the their own end zone. Swing it around to Osgar, covered by Russell now. Dump swing for Weinberg gets him to the break side and he gets a gainer to vote. A lot of undercuts right now for Sub. Not really attacking the deep space aggressively, but they finally do. And Osgar always ready to put it up. But Snell gets there first. Big block for the dark side alum. Yeah, it seems like Sakai is really keying in on the idea that the person who sub wants to huck is Osgar. So if Osgar doesn't have the disc, you can essentially front. They're helping a little bit as well. But And then when Osgar gets it, kind of a tight window and a, a difficult matchup with Snell to huck into. Snell sends it over to Katz to begin. Oh. Randolph underneath the pick call, but not involved in the throw. Second year sockeye cutter John Randolph with the disc. Gives it up to Katz and Katz throws a forehand out of bounds, but well downfield. So a new 70 in front of Minneapolis. Cheetah getting ready to bring it in on that front cone. Cousins in isolation, completely shut down by Snell, and forced to go into the backfield to get a reception. Nice adjustment by Cousins. Good work here by Sub to punish the switching from Sakai, knowing when they're being helped off of and going to get the disc. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a few months since Sub-Zero's got a chance to play, play against Sakai and try and get a sense of how this switching defense operates. And they're nowhere to really go. Brown. Puts up a hopeful forehand towards the end zone, but it's just a punt. Yeah. Sakai's D-line gets another possession. 
Good dump defense by Sakai. Really clogged up the handler set there. They shut down the first reset, but the first reset didn't clear, and it gave it really condensed the space that the the fill cutter had to work with. Timeout from Snell, recognizing an opportunity to extend the lead to four with another break. This timeout is presented by DiscStore.com. DiscStore.com is proud to support Ulti World and has a special team reversible offer for live viewers only. That is you folks. Get custom team reversibles, including a one color print for only $15 each using the promo code UltiWorld19. That's UltiWorld, that's us, and 19, the year. Email jerseys at discstore.com to receive the exclusive offer. As we hear the classic chants of we have got the ball from Sakai. Long time D-line timeout cheer. But they have stifled Sub-Zero right now. And on the break here, taking a look around the different fields, Amp is leading BFG in the mixed division, 8-7 at half. Brute Squad and up four goals on Phoenix in the women's quarter. Nightlock down by four to Fury in another women's quarter. Shame up by four on Snake Country in a mixed quarter. And BFG and Amp tied at sevens. Ring of Fire up 8-5 on Truck Stop. Lots of important games taking place. Quarterfinal round here. Got back-to-back -back quarterfinal rounds as Snell sends a forehand deep and an improbable catch by Kolchak. Turns into an assist and a break for Sakai. John Randolph gets the goal, but the highlight's going to go to Mitch Kolchak. Yeah, it's not a sub a tough spot. Really struggled to get pressure on defense and a few miscues on O. Well, not, not so much miscues. Uh, some great defensive performance from Sakai. Led to two breaks out of half here and it's gonna be tough to make for tough for sub to make up the make up this deficit. Yeah, you have to wonder if Sub missing one of their main throwers in Josh Klain is impacting their ability to perform on offense. Sustained a shoulder injury yesterday, and Klain really adds an additional dynamic edge to the offense. We touched on the idea earlier that Osgar is the primary person threatening the deep space, but Klain is such a creative thrower that he can hit those spaces on the field, creates more viable looks for their cutters, and also can break the mark to set other people up well. We see Klain, oh, always smiles on the sideline. Klain, noted jokester, but wearing sure, his, sure wishing he could be on the field. Wearing the his fashion baby, the sub orange tunic or orange kits on the year. But he will just have to watch his teammates try and mount a comeback, trailing ten to six against Sakai. This quarterfinal matchup. Winner will advance to semifinals to or to semifinals to face the winner of Truck Stop and Ring of Fire. You can see Sakai setting up the back of stack triangle. Even additional poaches out of the handler set here to try and disrupt any clean pull play. Just to wit, Ring of Fire with a healthy lead in that quarterfinal, 11 to five. So not a dissimilar margin from what we're seeing here, but these underdog teams now trying to find a way to overcome these deficits. So we see a stoppage in play and a discussion between Vandemortel and Snell. I think. What? Are you saying his position should be differently? I thought he took more yards than he could have, is what I'm saying. I felt like he ran through okay. his catch and then Less than three ground toss. Stop this place again. That's fine, my bad. No, you're fine. In on one. 
So travel discussion resolved. Vanna Mortel reinitiates them. Surrounded by Sakai defenders. Sub opting to keep five players around the disc against Sakai's three or four person cup. It's gonna leave pretty limited downfield targets for over the top and through throws. So Sub really gonna have to commit to working around this front wall. But stagnation with disc movement might make that a little more difficult. Had an interesting juxtaposition that the outsides of this Sakai Cup, Hausman and Snell, a lot of length there, and then stuck in the middle, the diminutive but agile Nathan Kwan. A Kwan, no stranger to being a risk taker in zones, it was a big part of North Carolina's junk set looks. Sub so really continuing to play five on four in the backfield letting Sakai guard their two downfield threats with three players. And Sakai hasn't quite clamped down from the downfield yet. Deeps are staying spaced out as Sub-Zero gets through to the red zone. Sheeta with it near the middle. Vander Mortel coming over from the defense to help Navigate Sakai's offense, perhaps Talos Boyd correctly predicting a zone point. Also just two breaks in a row, change out some bases. Cody Wood also crossing over from the D-line. Cousins over to Simonelli on the far sideline. Trap sprung now by Sakai, although I think they're is an injury from Simonelli as he pivoted around. I think this is another situation where Seb really misses Josh Klain. Klain, a very creative thrower, super comfortable with his flick blade, and is someone that can just take a part of zone like this if he sees an open look downfield. Simonelli, it looks like, with a cramp. And plenty of game to go, so hopes to work that out. He's been one of the key offensive components of the Sub-Zero attack, Kevin Brown subs in. Minneapolis keeping things moving, but slow goings. Brown back to Vanna Mortel and a lot of short, uncontested passes. Sakai seems content to let those happen. If Sub isn't really trying to do anything with the movement, they're not opening up holes or attacking them, and they lose yards almost as often as they gain them. Yeah, I think Sakai's just looking for one chance to pounce on a mistimed throw, maybe something that one of these quick cutters, or quick defenders outside of the cup can disrupt. Into Mortel and finds Osgar on the inside of the cup. Saka getting a little close to double teaming here. It's one thing if a, a crasher is coming and the open side of the cup is condensing, but. And there it is. Vander Mortel tries to throw a scuba that he had already telegraphed, quickly turns into a block, and now it's going all the way the other way, but beyond the reach of Houseman, so. A sigh of relief for Sakai's or for Sub Zero's offense. Surprised to see Sub Zero not try and get this off the line pretty quickly and get moving before Sakai can reset their junk. Yeah, a real lack of urgency allows Sakai to trap Sub Zero on the sideline, but perhaps recognizing that they've let us have most of these short throws if we want them. So Sheeta ends up with the disc in the middle again. Yeah, you can. St I keep harping on it, but there are five sub players behind the disc and only four Sakai players there, and they aren't swinging to the open fifth player. Well, they did find something they liked, which was Greg Cousins sneaking behind the deep defenders. Perhaps Sakai finally clamping down a little tighter, and now Nick votes in the red zone. A lot of contact on the cut. Eli Freeman colliding with Cousins. 
Vote frustrated as a blue card is issued to Friedman. Surprising that they missed the contain on the deep. Maybe a miscommunication downfield. Friedman a little surprised himself to get the blue card there. But what do you think, Keith? I, I wasn't actually looking at, in that part. Of, I was looking at Vote at the time, so I didn't quite see how the contact happened, just that there was a healthy amount of it. So Vote reinitiates. Cheetah throws the goal from inside of the end zone, so I think he's going to have to try again. Cheetah directing Snell back into position, and now things getting a little bit contentious down in this sub zero attacking end zone. A lot on the line for these two teams, and they'll have to maintain their composure. Checked in by Shida. And now a chance for, for Sakai to set up defensively. It doesn't help as Oscar's able to get free up the line. But what went from an easy fast break goal turned into a blue card and then a, a quality chance to set up def the defense for Sakai and then eventually a hold for Sub. You still have to like it if you're Sakai. Forced a lot of throws from Sub Zero. Third straight, third straight point, a lot of those players have been out there. So, still a deep point for Sakai. Made them work. Got to answer back now with a quick hold if they want to maintain the momentum. We see again the baffling Vanden Mortel turnover. Just as quick a turnover, although a little more understandable to look by the Sakai defense. But yeah, I, I imagine Sakai's going to be pretty comfortable with how that point went. Uh, but to go back to the to how you know how does how do you end up with that wide open Greg Cousins cut on the deep end? I mean if you're if you're Sakai watching what you've been seeing from the booth, five sub zero players all around the disc, tons of short throws, not a lot of looks over the top. It's easy to get lulled into that. Say you know if they're just going to play with five players up there, why don't we just move up and allow us to apply some pressure to maybe some of these resets? And as soon as Sakai gets in close. Sub-Zero springs free. Yeah, and great find by the thrower. However, they will need to get breaks on a now well-rested Sakai O. Bryce Dixon uncovered as he takes the pass. Trent Dillon underneath. Uncovered Raider, so it seems like there's some poaching and switching happening from Sub Zero. Sakai looks to take advantage with a deep shot to Trent Dillon, and Trent Dillon going upstairs for the grab. Wow, yeah, a little bit of help in the deep space. I think Jerk was helping deep, but as soon as he comes out, Sakai puts up the huck to Dillon, and Dillon gets up to pull down the sky. Take another look. Raider again, completely unmarked. Dylan with the long give and go, just takes off for making that cross field throw. And the defender in good enough position to contest, but Dylan attacking the disc high for the score. Yeah, Dylan following a good offensive principle, dumps it for a little bit of yard loss to the open side, realizes that he's shallow on the break side of the thrower, in a good position to cut deep, and really finishes that cut, high points the disc. It's not much of a stretch for him to catch it with his right hand, but uses the appropriate hand to catch it to body out. Really clinical work by Trent Dillon. That one might make it to the Ulti Photos highlights folder for day two. So, Sakai now with a 11-7 lead over Sub-Zero. Sakai successfully slowed the game down quite a bit with this zone. So they may go back to it, or they may be looking to mix up, mix up things, try and keep this offense on their toes. Find out what Mike Caldwell and Dave Hogan have in store. Sakai coaching staff sends their defense out. Sheeta takes the centering pass. 
quick deep look to a completely blown coverage. Simonelli tries to milk that one into the end zone and successfully does. So twice we've seen Sub-Zero get behind the defense. And this time a mental mistake costs Sakai to the benefit of Sub-Zero to make it 11-8. Yeah, just blown coverage by Sakai there. Not a great look for them. But Sub-Zero does well to find it and flip in the hold. Momentum a little bit back up for grabs after uh, such I mean, Trent Dillon Sky obviously got the sidelines going, got people into it, but giving up a, an easy hold like that can take the win right back out of your sails. So Sub could make a run here if they could convert a break. Yeah, that, that's exactly what Sub needs is an emphatic break, whether it comes from a big play, whether it comes from a long, drawn-out point, whatever it takes. Right now, this game feels a little bit like both teams are reserved, and, and we're waiting for that, for that spark to get the intensity fired back up because the end of this game is coming coming too. You know, it's 11-8. Four more Sakai goals would send them to semifinals. Sub-Zero ready to pull. Cody Wood who played for Penn State before doing grad student work at Minnesota and joining the Sub-Zero team. Former U24 player, one of a couple on Sub-Zero. Free child out on the sideline, swinging to Murray. Montague coming under. Is Sub trying to help off the weak side a little more than they have in past points as Sakai tries to create that isolation on the top of the screen. Free child gets it back to Montague. He considers a long throw. Came to Allison Hall, but now forced to go backwards. Very few options. Nice defense in the reset space, but Montague couldn't call a foul. You can see Sakai's. We're just pointing out this call. I heard this call. Definitely, this going to come to you. Okay. So the ruling is no stall. It'll be a turn here. Because out of his hand. Right here. <laughs> Montague, Montague made, the, made the foul call symbol, but it was actually a stall call contested and upheld. So just a, a discussion about the placement of the turn. Jurek underneath now. Just reset so far for the Sub-Zero offense. Wood finally gets it off the line. <coughs> Wiston Dune over to Wood. Back with Vanden Mortel. Cutters stagnant downfield as the handlers continue to just move in amongst one another. Jurek takes off into double coverage. Free child tries to go over the back. Jurek gets there first, but can't come down with it. And again, you see that help defense from Sakai. And I think with, with so little movement downfield, Sub-Zero was happy to take the first look they saw. Yeah, a little bit more disc stagnation this game than I'm used to seeing from Sub. We'll see if they can earn another chance at a break here. They did a really good job of taking away Sakai's isolation space and then forcing them to go back into their stack. Sakai didn't move the move the space. So perhaps Sub can lull them into that again. Sub-Zero's defense now one for eight in break chances. That 12% conversion rate just might not get it done. Free child, kind of no looks to this break side to Cassender. Free child takes off and Montague lofts one to the end zone and the speedy free child tracks it down. That's a tough one to swallow for Sub-Zero. 
got the turn, possessed it for a while, but gave it back and eventually to give up the hold on a, on a big play like that to a fiery player like Free Child, it's got to sting. Free Child showing off the speed. As soon as he took off, it was obvious Montague was going to put that out in front of him. Defender nowhere to be seen. As Free Child pulls away for the score. And Sakai pulls away with a 12-8 lead now. Montague and Free Child have been playing together a long time. Teammates on the U20 team in 2010. Teammates on the Next Gen Tour. Now teammates on Sakai, so that chemistry is definitely there. Free Child in his third season with Sakai. Played for Portland Rhino for a number of years, and it was quite a story when he decided to move over to join this Sakai program. And now that he's brought his talents to Seattle, he's gotten a chance to play in a lot of big games. Famously, had not had a ton of success at Nationals with that Rhino team. But his Rhino, uh, former Rhino teammates are in quarterfinals. It's true. A big win over Boston Dig. And Free Child's still very much Oregon in his roots. He's an assistant coach at the University of Oregon for the men's team, Ego. So another junkie set from Sakai. It looks like a, a transition set there. It could have been 2-3-2. Two, two. They're, they're already transitioning, so it's tough to diagnose. But well played by Sakai to break up any initiation from Sub-Zero. Trapped on the line. Offline throw finds Sheeta. Sheeta continues to the break side with the inside throw for Osgar. Brown, cross for Cousins as a pick is called. I was pretty surprised to see Osgar look off the cross field shot to Simonelli. Well, Sakai certainly knew it was coming. There was a yeah. lot of communication from the sideline about watching out for that, and the stack was heads up. Left a wide open Kevin Brown for the swing. Cousins tries to retet to Sheeta, but the coverage from Quad too tight. Now, Snell ahead to Quad. Sakai seeking their largest lead of the game. Just a couple yards away from extending their advantage to five goals as Russell goes around and pops into the air. It'll be a jump ball. Freeman has two shots at it. Four sub-zero players around him, but Friedman catches the second effort. That's got to be a stinger for sub-zero. They see that break goal fall into the hands of Freeman and Sakai. Yeah, it's tough times for Sub-Zero. Quan and Shida have been battling most of the game, and Quan gets the better of him after putting in a lot of work, and then the uh, the luck arrow just goes your way on this one. Four Sub-Zero shirts, but one Sakai goal. Yeah, a little a little weird to see no Sakai players think, oh, we should go over there too, in case this like pops in the air, but I guess they just knew Freeman was going to come down with it. Yeah, Freeman. Freeman won the Callahan. He can take care of himself. <laughs> Another former Rhino player who defected to Sakai. But after after one like that and, and the momentum fully in, in the hands of Seattle, we see a timeout on the field. Sub-Zero trying to rally for one last push to save their season and make it to the semifinals. This timeout is presented by Disc Store. Discstore.com sells more than discs. For live viewers only, get your next custom team reversibles, including a one-color print for only $15 each with the promo code ultiworld19. Just gotta email that promo code ultiworld19 to jerseys at discstore.com to receive that exclusive offer. Yeah, by all accounts, it looks like if things hold, the winner of this game will play Raleigh Ring of Fire in their semi. Ring of Fire currently up 12-7 on DC Truck Stop. Tough, tough result for DC, the number three seed overall team with high hopes this year perhaps the most talented team they fielded only only to be felled by ring of fire in this one 
Ohio Sheet has had a lot more success as we see Sakai's stats so far. Five for eight on break opportunities in this game. Yeah, if you remember the stats out of half, it was three offensive turnovers apiece. So Sakai has coughed it up once. Sub-Zero has given it up four or five times this half. And Sakai has put in three of those. So the stats really reflecting the wheels coming off a little bit for Sub-Zero. And unless they can find a way to pressure the Sakai offense, it'll be it'll be tough sledding for them to get back into this, and it's already quite late. Pull going up from Sakai. So we see some new faces on the field for their defense, opening up the rotation with that five-goal lead. And not making the same mistakes as their predecessors. A little bit of a blown coverage as Cousins again gets behind the defense. The two late alum finding success in the deep space and now has his team in the red zone and under great pressure gets one over to Vander Mortel for a quick sub-zero hold and you know that's a good way to start getting yourself back into this game is get the offense on and off the field in short order. Yeah, tough for the the lower part of the soccer rotation to not make sub work for it a little more on there. Though it's obviously extremely difficult to not be in a rhythm in the game and come in and try and execute against a high quality opponent. But Cousins slips deep and a brief goal line stand, but sub flips in the easy hold. Cousins making the layout for the catch. Greg Cousins has just one assist in this game, but the six year sub zero player 27-year-old has had a nice game. Picked up plenty of yardage for his teammates, even if he's not getting into the end zone quite as frequently as some others. Yeah, Greg Cousins is a high-quality player. Played at Tulane, maybe not the biggest college program, but was the notorious guy always wearing his sub-zero tights and playing for them. But subs cutter core is high-quality. And and this is a guy who's developed. I mean, he when he first started with sub-zero, I think he was more of a role player. Uh, had a, has grown his role year after year. Now is in a big position on their starting O-line. It's the Sakai starting O-line with the wind at their backs, so to speak, as they come back out. Janin takes off deep, opens up some space, comes back under for the gainer. Janin. Looking deep for Dylan with separation. Great throw from Jan and keeps Kevin Pettit scaling from having any shot at that one. A quick hold for Sakai to make it 13 to nine. Yeah, Pettit scaling really was giving Dylan a little too much horizontal cushion there. Dylan felt like he had a vertical step as well as that spacing took off and Jacob Jan does well to fade that throw to the back shoulder and throw the defender out of the play. So the offense gets their seventh clean hold of the game for Sakai. Dylan finds the end zone again. It's his second trip. Well, not quite as spectacular as the previous one, but turns out they all count the same. Yep. Sakai on the doorstep. Jacob Janin with one goal, two assists in this game. The another former Rhino player played with the Whitman Suites in college. When D D three school that back then was D one Nationals program. Yeah. Jacob Janin, Jeremy Norton, who's here with Go Goat, mm -hmm. really powering them to a championship. And people who came to light later is very <laughs> influential in that. Ben McGinn played with Rhino briefly. His, his dad, a longtime coach for Oregon Ego, Jay, Jay Jannon. Yeah, the uh, coaching alongside Dylan Freechild for Ego. Jacob is a is, is a effective player for this O line. It has been for a couple years now. He watches his opposing O line go out there in desperate need of a hold. 
Game point now for Sockeye's defense. Cheetah streaks into the backfield. Sure happy to not see Quan matched up with him anymore. <laughs> but a throw behind from Vote. Just a miss from Vote. Had an open receiver. Sockeye with a chance to put this one away. Ben Snell in the middle. Sub-Zero on their last legs now. Freeman puts it up deep, jump ball. John Randolph against Greg Cousins. John Randolph comes down with it. The Brown College star makes the play on the other end and Seattle Sockeye dispatches Sub-Zero 15-9 in the quarterfinals. Yeah, great play by Randolph. A lot of body positioning battle between him and Cousins. Obviously, contact back and forth. Nothing too egregious, though. And Randolph reads the disc well, cuts off Cousins' path to it, and goes up strong. Bit of a hanger. <laughs> Gets rid of the hat. You can see the push, but Randolph does well to put Cousins on his back, really dominate that space, and complete the catch. <laughs> Yeah, Randolph, I don't, th I don't think he skips a lot of leg days. A little pushing is not going to take him out of his position. Yeah, I'm pretty sure all John Randolph eats is chicken and creatine. And goals, apparently, as he gets in the end zone. Although I believe that's his first. It was the final goal of this game. Sakai wins this one 15-9. We're going to do a live look in as soft cap goes off. We will... Take a look in at a mixed quarterfinal. Seattle BFG and Philadelphia Amp. Amp in the reds, BFG in the whites. Amp with an 11-8 lead, the reigning national champs against the reigning world champs. Seattle BFG, although this BFG team's pretty different from that team. In many ways, so is this Amp team. BFG, one of the stories of yesterday, having one pool A, defeating Dragon Thrust, while Amp was a story for the wrong reasons. Number three overall seed. Almost, almost lost all of their games, but instead won two of them. Very narrow wins. Or won one of them, excuse me. So, narrow win over Moondog, a comeback. Saved them from being eliminated on day one. While BFG went undefeated. But still a good showing. They were up on Mischief quite late in the game. Mischief made a late run to win. So up and down from AMP, as they have been all season to an extent. We saw that in the final of the Pro Flight Champion, or the US Open, where they went down to mixtape. Well, BFG into the end zone for a hole to make it 11 to nine. Kerry Chang catching that goal. So BFG alive in, a, in what I believe should be a game of 13 at this juncture. 11-9 in favor of Philadelphia. Trying to bounce back from a difficult day yesterday. They started today with a 15-12 win over DC Space Heater in a semifinal rematch. No bobbles necessary. But they did trail 7-5 to BFG earlier in this game. They've been on quite a run since then. And making a habit out of the comeback here in San Diego. So 11-9, BFG trails. Take a look at the AMP O-line, or at least a portion of it. Looks like they're short one. These two teams fighting to get in the semifinals to face the winner of Fort Collins Shame and Boston Snake Country. Shame with a healthy lead in that matchup. So, or is it lays out for the save? Pape though with nowhere to go right now. Stoppage. I'm, I'm thinking Pape may have tried to draw the contact here to get the counter reset. Mott frustrated, although unclear if it's with the call or with himself. Looks like, based on the continued conversation, that he has some disagreements with Pape. So you 
Casey. We are in a live look in this mixed division quarterfinal. Just wrapped up the men's division game between Seattle Sakai and Sub Zero. Sakai wins that 15 9. Cap is on in this one, so this is a game to 13, we believe. Amp with an 11 9 lead. BFG on the doorstep of a pivotal break. Stirring television as players discuss in excess. And looks like they agree to contest. Agree to disagree. Reset, and then Mott, I think, got a hand block on that, but saved by Hooper. Ng, not sure that it was, so time for a little more conversation. What we all tuned in to see. Observer ruling is up, so Hooper will keep it. A great save by Hooper on a would-be turnover. And a brutal one at that, a red zone turnover with a chance to break to make it a one goal game. Instead, BFG gets back within one. They trail 11 to 10 following that break. Hooper to Pape for the goal. So BFG now one goal away from drawing even. Amp looking to win two of these next three. So we see Hooper with the layout grab, definitely up. Not sure Ing really has claimed any sort of great perspective on the matter. We'll see if this game gets contentious. I mean, these are two teams that know each other well. They both have high aspirations at this tournament. And margin's very slim. It's hot out. See the amp sideline discussing a bit. BFG puts a new D-line out there hoping to continue to add as they have scored the past two. And neither of these teams is a stranger to a, a big moment like this. BFG reigning world champions. Amp reigning national champions. But to be fair, a lot of players in new or bigger roles for this team, including Reed Koss, joining BFG this year. There's his pull, although he's no stranger to high pressure situations. He's been in plenty of high leverage spots. Yeah, Reed Koss, a former Sakai captain, so just saw his old team play. And a quick turnover from Amp. Not sure exactly what happened there, but Jordan Ryan not on the same page with his reset as he throws a casual offhand throw to nobody. And now BFG with a chance to really seize momentum and put the pressure back on amp side. And they do with a continued throw from Chang to bend it. BFG fired up. Kerry Chang got his team hype. And Ryan looks a little beside himself. Amp, even with BFG 11-11 in a game of 13 with a spot semifinals on the line on the other side, the end of your season. Well, this is the situation that you envision at practice at the end. If you do the, the pressure drill, 0-0, zero, zero, game to two, season on the line. But we all know, Cody, that it doesn't feel the same. Be it, be it, I, I've certainly never played in any national quarterfinals, but anybody who's played been, been in a spot where a game you really want to win and you're tied with, with only a little bit to do to get there. Practice, you try and build up those muscles, but it's hard to get ready for this spot. Yeah, I think that's why it's so important that many of these players, though you said there, as you said, there's been some turnover, but the teams themselves have been there and as an institution, the fact that your team has been there before just helps you in a subcon subconscious level. 
veteran veterans who can provide that steadying presence. Plenty of those on both sides. Amp, as we see Raha Mazafari, one of the leaders of this team. On the O-line, Michael Ng returning to Amp. He's played with them in critical games. Otta Thompson, holding the disc now. But Amp has given up three straight. Can they fight off BFG to get to semifinals again? Mazafari yeah. looking off Morse. The four women on the field for Amp have been the only ones to get touches so far. Foul call in the backfield. Discussion now between Natalie Bova and Mariah Bell Sims. Looks like players will agree. Stall count's going back to zero. Bova looking for options. Forced to throw a space throw up to Mazafari, and it's knocked away by Alyssa Sue. Ing with the travel call against Pape. Draw some criticism from the crowd. Pape putting up another jump ball. I mean, this game has been a lot of high, th high throws, hoping to, on receivers to make a play. A wasted opportunity for BFG to continue their run. Now it's Ing looking deep. Thompson with separation. Thompson with the layout. Beyond the reach of the Amp Star. So back in the hands of the BFG defense. Looking to extend their run to four straight. Amp came back from a 7-5 de deficit to get to this point, but they have anything left in the tank. Another jump ball from BFG. And this one, Pape comes down with over a pile of players. And a second remarkable catch. BFG on a 4-0 run against Amp as they continue to come down with impressive catches after unimpressive throws. Yeah, it doesn't have to be pretty, but it is exciting and apparently it's very effective. The BFG really seizing momentum in this game, now on the doorstep of booking their spot in the quarterfinals, or the semifinals, excuse me. Jonas Golden with the goal. Comes up with it with a Difficult catch, one-handed in the back of the end zone for that one. BFG get, getting it done however they come, you know, they all count the same, there's no style points in this game. Yeah, exactly, I mean, that was BFG's game <laughs> a few years back. They had a lot of tall people and good throwers. I wonder if, if Amp's maybe getting lulled into playing that style too. Yeah, I think the the wind might have a little bit of a factor on it, but it's so gusty, it's hard to really alter your style. Pape manages to come down with that one. And then says, if I'm gonna make a hard catch, why don't you do it too? But technically, that was a, an upwinder though, I believe so. BFG slightly with the wind here, trying to break to win the game. BFG hoping to reach the semifinals. Not a good way to start here for Amp as the pull rolls out the back. So far, one for one Seattle teams reaching the semifinals out of the quarterfinals. Still have Seattle Riot and Seattle Mixtape to come in later quarterfinal rounds. 
Camp. An error in the reset area, but Ryan with a foul call. Chang seems to have other thoughts. Ryan, one of those new faces on this AMP team. Played with high five previously. Played at, played at Kenyon College previously as well. Uh, I believe his teammate Jordan Ryan also a Kenyan alumni. No, that yeah, that's Jordan Ryan is, is Kenyan alumni. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood you. <laughs> But Ryan is in his first year on the team has been given a, a big role. Had to has had to fill, you know, they lost a lot of their throwers with Nikki Spiva, Carolyn Normile, Calvin Trisolini. These are players who were there pick up the disc handlers. And so Ryan has kind of been thrust into that role in a big way this year. And now has to come up with some big plays for his team under pressure. Foul call upheld. So Ryan keeps possession in his own end zone. Bobby Rue over to Ryan. Ryan winds one up, puts it out to Sean Mott. That's a tried and true strategy for Amp. And Mott's continued throw dies on him, an open receiver, but he edges that into the grass. Are we seeing Amp unravel in the quarterfinals. Just a just a brutal turn. A brutal turn. Not up to the <laughs> the quality of Sean Ma as a player, but also maybe a little bit rushed. And and you know, at, since we tuned into this game, it's been BFG making the plays. The poor throws have been completed by BFG. They had the catch by Jimmy Hooper on the goal line where he saved it off the turf. They had the difficult catch by Pape on the jump ball and the follow-up hard catch. Amp has not been able to make those plays. Yeah, it's just, you have to think momentum plays into that in part as we see Amp poach out of the stack and intercept that to get themselves a shorter field, potentially to force double game point. Timely poach block by Bobby Rue, and he has the easy throw into the end zone for Linda Morse. All right, folks, buckle up. Oh. All the marbles here for BFG and Amp. You can thank Buffalo Wild Wings for turning <laughs> this live look in into a double game point situation. Buffalo. Use the promo code ultiworld 19 <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings did not know they were sponsoring this broadcast, but they are now and will be sending you a bill shortly. 12-12 uh, though, one of my favorite things in Ultimate, double season point. I don't know if I can get on board with you on that one, Keith. Get, get on the train before it leaves. You don't want to be left behind on this one, Cody. DSB, DSB is so serious. You're going to a place I, I cannot follow. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to try and convince me that the point for half is galaxy point. I will, never, I will not do that. You're sadly mistaken. As Amp tries to plan out the D-line that will either be on as they go to semifinals or watch BFG march on in their place. Right now, Truck Stop trying to work on an improbable comeback against Ring of Fire in the men's semi in the men's quarterfinals. Ring of Fire up 14-11 on Truck. They were up by a larger margin earlier. Still, Truck Stop alive. The winner of this game will move on to face Fort Collins Shame. 115-11 over Boston Snake Country. Shame, the number nine overall seed already in the semifinals. If BFG can get this one, we'll get nine and eight in the mixed in the mixed semifinals. And correction, that score was 15-8 Shame. So a comfortable win for Fort Collins. BFG sets up isolation here. Hits their first under, but stagnation is incoming. Going to have to swing across the field. High stall, but finds the reset and then Looks like a cramp here, non-contact. And that body language screams out cramp. Great to see two teams that are competing to go to semifinals and have every reason to be against each other. Tommy Lee happy to jump in and help give a stretch. Uh, 
Oh, if you're Amp's sideline, you can't let the other sideline beat you to aiding your team. I was just going to say, this is a this tough is look for Amp's sideline. Not looking good, Amp's sideline. <laughs> Luke Ryan would be a big loss. I mean, he's one of the top defenders on this AMP defense. Now they'll have to try and get a break without him. It'll be Paul Owens subbing in in his place. Matching up with Tommy Lee. Suspiciously absent Sean Mott from this point for Amp. Around break. Deep stack right now for BFG as they want to leave lots of room for throws to space for these handlers. And a drop in the reset space. Julia Bladen lets that one get away from her. One of the most important players for this BFG team. So a great short field opportunity for him. Starts with Steve Rosso, gets it over to Michael Ng. If we've seen anything in this game, it's that turnovers are a plenty, and just as we say it, Amp coughs it up. Mazafari with the layout, she's frustrated, got both hands on that one, but couldn't secure it. So after both turnovers, I think the pressure is really mounted for these two teams. Veteran Mario O'Brien picks it up, immediate timeout. BFG gonna try and draw something up. Amp has been in so many close games this weekend. One, that dramatic semifinal on double game point last season. So we know that they can compete at this level. The FG team, though, has been one of the finest teams at this tournament through their first three games. Undefeated up to this point, took down the number one overall seed, Dragon Thrust. But will their journey end in quarterfinals? Ryan stands over the disc. Picks up. Eric Nardelli on the mark. Get, getting an update now from the men's quarterfinals. Truck stop actually able to score another break, but ran out of time. Hard cap is on, so ring of fire up two. This point will not affect them. As play begins here, once more, stoppage though, just as I say that. A ring able to close out the 14-12 victory, so it'll be ring Sakai in one side of the men's semis. Familiar faces in the semifinals. Not the story in the mixed division, however. Tommy Lee underneath. Lots of room again for the handlers, and they have use this dump and fill frequently sending one reset up the line and now sending Tommy Lee deep contested space this has been where BFG has been winning so far but not this time Paul Owens subbed in for double game point midpoint comes up with the block Ing around to Owens Amp working with their second break opportunity semifinals 35 yards away from them. Owens looking deep, has Ng with space. Ng comes down with it. Amp goes to semifinals. BFG is done. Amp staving off that late run by BFG. BFG goes on a 4-0 run to force double game point, but Amp scores the one that matters. Closing it out deep to Michael Ng. And, and Ng had a rough stretch during that BFG run but at the final moment, comes up with the big play his team needs, comes down with the catch, 
But really, Paul Owens, the hero of that point. The guy subbed in. You love to see it. Yeah, your eighth man. Gets his number called, First. comes up with the big block. Then a key part of that score. So a, a testament to Amp's depth that they can play their eight-person universe line to come up with the win. Huge block with the game on the line. Then he throws the game-winning assist. Cross field, the 20-year-old Paul Owens. 13-12, Amp. Coming up with big plays. Didn't start this weekend as a big name. Maybe he will end it as one as his team will go on. They'll get another chance to show off what he can do in the semifinals with Amp as they take on Fort Collins. Shame. BFG, a strong effort here at the national championships, but come up just short in quarterfinals despite an incredible comeback on their part. It's been a live look in here for Ulti World. We're checking around to see if there's any other games we might be able to get to. We have a, another quarterfinal coming up in just a bit. Dragon Thrust taking on Mixtape. Another mixed division quarterfinal. So you'll definitely want to be here for that one. Those two teams know a thing or two about playing each other. So if you want to catch two of the top mixed division teams playing on one of the biggest stages you will find. Be here with Ulti World in just a few. See you then. We come in all different shapes and sizes, but our uniforms don't. Equipped with multiple jersey cuts, lengths, and sizes, Full Circle is the perfect fit for your whole team. Look better, feel better, play better. Full Circle.